Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, October the 30th, 2020. It is currently 1059 a.m. Central Time. I'm here at Victory Baptist Church located in Ovalo, Texas. And just a few minutes ago, I was live on the air. And right, right as I was about to conclude that live broadcast, I got a notification on the iPad that I was looking at. And here's the notification. It comes to me via the Spreaker app. So if you have the Spreaker app, you can subscribe to this. And you can listen to it for yourself. We're going to be listening to it together in this episode. But here's what I saw on my iPad. Again, it's a notification I got from the Spreaker app. And it says this. Listen to the latest episode of Sky News Daily. All right. That's one of the news uh, podcasts that I subscribe to. Sky News Daily. So listen to the latest episode of Sky News Daily. And then here's the title of the episode they want me to listen to. QAnon. Why is 2020 the perfect storm for a conspiracy theory? QAnon, why is 2020 the perfect storm for a conspiracy theory? Now, immediately I was like, okay, wait a minute. This is more information about the QAnon conspiracy theory. I've talked about it. I talked about it. But that question is what really what really got my attention. That question is what drove me to go, okay, put the iPad down, turn over here to the laptop. Let's set this up. Let's go live. Let's, let's discuss this. So I, let's go to that question they ask. All right, let, let's, let's look at it again. QAnon. Let's forget that. Let's go to the question. Why is 2020 the perfect storm for a conspiracy theory? All right. Why is 2020 the perfect storm for a conspiracy theory? That's the question I want you to consider. That's the question I want you to think about it. And I want you to think about it in two ways. All right. First, why is 2020 the perfect storm for a conspiracy theory? I think a better way to put it is why is 2020 a perfect storm for conspiracy theories, plural, within society? That's the first way I want you to ask the question. Why is 2020 the perfect storm for conspiracy theories within society? All right, that's the first thing I want you to consider. Second, why is 2020 the perfect storm for conspiracy theories inside the church? Why is, so number one, why is 2020 the perfect storm for conspiracy theories within society? And number two, why is 2020 the perfect storm for conspiracy theories inside the church, within the church? Right? I think these, I think we have to really consider this. Now, we're going to listen to this, this report. We're going to listen to it and we're going to analyze it. But I think this is where we really need to begin because so many people, just yesterday, I think it was yesterday or maybe two days ago, someone posted a notification um, or, you know, a, a comment, a reply um, and I got the notification. Uh, they 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 posted it via our YouTube page, and our YouTube page. Just remember, is not it's all all our YouTube pages is, is it uploads when I do a live broadcast. As soon as I'm done, it automatically uploads to YouTube. All right, it's not video; it's just the audio. Okay, so we're we're not. I mean, YouTube is a weird place for our stuff to go. I'm grateful that it's there because maybe we can pick up some listeners. But I mean, our numbers are not very good on YouTube. We're not really accomplishing much. But hey, if someone stumbles across our stuff and it leads to them listening to everything, then that's that's wonderful. My philosophy is I got to put my podcast anywhere and everywhere on every podcasting platform on the face of the planet if I want to have any kind of of, of major success and any uh, long Long, a far-reaching impact because if you just try to stay on one platform, you're you're going to miss out all the people who use different platforms. So I go, I try to get our stuff everywhere that I possibly can. So we're glad that it's there, but a lot of people who discover us on YouTube, they don't understand my perspective. They don't know who I am. They don't even know where I come from. But guess what? That doesn't stop them from doing. It doesn't stop them from commenting, right? And so many times they misunderstand my point. Listen, whatever is going on in society, my concern, whatever is happening in the society politically, whatever is happening in the world politically, whatever is happening in the world when it comes to conspiracy theories, my major issue is what it coming into the church. 
My concern is that Christianity is being systematically destroyed. Christianity is being systematically redefined while Christians are sitting there distracted by the fires burning within the culture. We're so worried about the culture wars that we're not realizing that Christianity is being rewritten right in front of us and we don't even realize it. We're, we're clueless. It's like, look, they're like, look at, look at the fires over there and we're watching the fires burn within society and we're yelling and screaming about it and we're wanting this done and this done to change the culture. And while we're doing that, we're going to turn around at some point and we're going to go, wait, where's Christianity? Yeah, Christianity was rewritten, redefined and destroyed while you weren't paying any attention. So my concern is always about how how things get into the church, what's happening to the church. And so many people still don't seem to get my perspective, right? They, they, I don't, I don't understand how they don't get my perspective because I repeat myself like 5,000 times. I'll get some people emailing me. Will you stop repeating yourself? Well, if I don't stop repeating my, obviously I'm not repeating myself enough because people still don't get my perspective. I'm worried about the church, right? Theology central podcast, right? That's 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 what I'm trying to do. We're focused on things from a theological perspective. So, so you may be asking, well, if you're so worried about the church, why are you asking the question, why is 2020 the perfect storm for conspiracy theories within the culture? Because I think taking a look at the culture briefly will explain what's happened to the church. So I'm going to answer these questions. All right. Are you ready? Here's the first, here's the first question. Why is 2020 the perfect storm for conspiracy theories within culture? The answer is, is so obvious. The answer is right there. I'm I'm assuming that there are people listening to me right now and you're already screaming the answer at your mobile device, right? You're screaming your answer because you know the answer and I wish I could hear you, right? I mean, you can email me your answer, but I I can almost guarantee you're going to say the same thing I'm about to say if you're paying any attention. In fact, I will say this. If you're a listener to this program, I know you're going to have the right answer because my listening audience is 98% smarter than all the other audiences to all the other programs. My audience is the smartest. It it really is, okay? Because you made the right decision to listen to me. So obviously you're you're, you're really smart. You see how I kind of made it about me and not about you. Okay, but you get the idea, all right? So here we go. The reason 2020 is the perfect storm for conspiracy theories to spread within the culture is because the culture has 1,000% abandoned the concept of absolute truth. And once there is no, I, there's no concept of absolute truth, then there is no real standard for truth. So then you can believe anything. You believe any idea. You, you don't even know what truth is. The society has, look, society, I know I always say this in the most graphic way possible, and it offends some people, but I don't care. I've got to say it in the most graphic way possible to really give you the force of the idea. Our culture took truth, they drug it behind the building, and they went pop, pop, pop. They put three bullets in its head. Truth is dead to our society. Truth is whatever you want it to be. Truth is whatever I want it to be. We see this even in the news media. Hey, this is what we report. It's true. This is what we report. And, they, and, and guess what they report? They report more their ideology than they do facts. Or they, or they spend more time interpreting the facts through the lens of their ideology. And now it's very difficult to get facts. It's very difficult to get truth because society has abandoned the truth. So society, here's what's so weird. The society that abandoned the truth, the society that took truth out back and put three bullets in its head, is the same society now going, what's happened? We can't get the facts. We can't get the truth. What's happened with all these conspiracy theories? Well, you you said there was no absolute truth. You said there was your truth and my truth, and they were both true. Well, if there is no ultimate truth, no absolute truth, then everyone does what is right in their own eyes. Everyone thinks what is right in their own eyes. Everyone views the world through their own particular perspective, and they believe they to be right. And guess what? I can b- bring all the facts in the world to them, and guess what? They don't care because my facts don't coincide with their truth. And so therefore my facts are wrong because facts no longer matter. Truth no longer matters. Truth is whatever you want it to be. Truth is whatever you say it is. The philosophy of relativism swept through society like a plague. Okay. And, and, and there were people warning everyone about relativism. I was warning people about relativism in the 1990s in my, when I taught a class to singles at Heartland Baptist Church in Bellevue, Nebraska. 
I was warning them about relativism, 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 because it was already sweeping the culture. And here we are in 2020. And guess what? (laughs) We are reaping the consequences of relativism. And it's through society. Society is completely vulnerable to this idea. And now anyone can say anything. All you got to do, listen, all you got to do in 2020 is not prove to people your perspective via facts. You just got to convince them to listen to you and to follow you. All you got to do is get them to believe you. You don't, and I don't even care about facts. If they like what you say, they're going to go along with it, whether the facts agree or disagree with them, because the truth no longer matters. So guess what happens? The, the culture abandoned truth. Relativism infected all of our, our all of society and we're reaping the consequences of it we're reaping the fruits of that right we planted relativism and once we planted relativism it's now grown up into a tree of universal deception that is exactly what has happened but guess what as relativism was spreading in the culture guess what it did it's 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 the relativistic thinking this idea of not worried about facts and that you don't you can't believe any facts unless you agree with the facts somehow somehow this idea that if i agree with something then it's factual and if i disagree with it then it's fake news that's I so, i'm so tired of hearing the term fake news we believe it's fake when it doesn't agree with us if it agrees with us it's true right so if i believe certain things about covid and and i and and someone bring brings information that contradicts the way i think about covid well then i say that's fake news because nope i don't believe that and so then you go find any facts that supposedly support your perspective nobody cares about truth well guess what that's so prevalent in society and guess what happens whatever is prevalent in society always comes walking through the front door of the church because Christians are far more influenced by society than they like to pretend they are. They try to pretend it's all about Jesus. It's about the Bible. But in reality, you're being influenced by society. So guess what? The relativism that infected the culture has now infiltrated the church. So why is 2020 the perfect storm for conspiracy theory? Conspiracy theories? Um, well, inside the church, because the, the relativism of the culture has come inside the church. And the church will claim they believe in truth. They will claim they believe in absolute truth, but they don't understand that this relativistic idea has caused them to become completely blinded and how to research facts, study facts, accept facts. No, I, you could argue, you could argue. You could argue, listen, now listen to what I'm about to say here because I think this is a very important principle, that relativism leads to ideological blindness or relativism is the disease. One of the symptoms of, is ideological blindness. How does this work? Well, if relativism is the dominant philosophy, well, this begins to say your truth is truth. So then, then your ideology begins to replace facts and truth. Your, your belief system, your ideology now becomes the, the standard, right? And so guess what? Now you're so ideologically blind that even when someone places facts before you, you can't see the facts. All you can see is your ideology. But that, that what led to the ideological blindness, ideological blindness is simply a symptom of relativism. Relativism says your truth, my truth, we're all true. So then we begin to think, hey, my truth is true. What I think is true. And now we replace facts with ideology. And then we can only see, we only agree with the facts that support our ideology. That's called ideological blindness. So the church, in some cases, relativism is the, is the disease but the symptom of ideological blindness, maybe ideological blindness is, is now, it, the symptom has become so, pro, uh, so evident, this symptom, that we're, we're, still, we're, we're not looking at the, the, the ultimate cause. We're not looking at the disease. We're looking at the symptom. The symptom is ideological blindness, but the cause is relativism. Relativism says your truth, my truth. And so then we say, forget facts. It's my truth. So now my ideology becomes truth. 
And then anything that disagrees with my ideology is fake news and it's not factual. And you see this everywhere. Look, you can have a liberal, a liberal online, right? And you, you'll you present some kind of facts about something Trump did, something Trump said that was positive, that was good, that was beneficial. No, fake news. And then you go to the conservative and you say something about Trump that he did, you know, he did this wrong, he did this wrong. Fake news. You go to a liberal about something in regards to COVID and they don't like it, fake news. You go to a conservative, something about they don't like, fake news. Why? Because they're so ideologically blind. And that's really, that's the result of relativism because they think that truth is what they want it to be. Listen, ideology has replaced truth. So that's why 2020 is so, the perfect storm for conspiracy theories because of relativism that swept the culture. That's why the culture was vulnerable to it. And then the culture crept into the church. And now the church is infected with one of the major symptoms of ideological blindness. Right? That, that's kind of my analysis of, of that question. Why is it the perfect storm? Now we're going to see how they, this news report, how they try to handle it. But I want to lay that down there. And again, what am I concerned with? Let me make it very clear. The culture is, I don't care about the, I don't care that the culture is swimming in a sea of relativism. I mean, I wish, I wish, because what they ultimately need is, uh, from, from a Christian perspective, a theological perspective, they need salvation. Now, which it makes it very difficult to present the gospel because now the gospel is just viewed as that's your truth. My truth doesn't accept Christianity and I can be okay and you can be okay. Like, like it's, it's, it's very hard to bring a dogmatic doctrine of here's salvation, here's truth, and a world that rejects the very concept. So that makes evangelism very difficult in 2020. But our, the church, so, so I can't, I can't, I can't be as, I, I'm not worried when I say I don't care. In other words, what the world does is ultimately irrelevant to me in the sense of they can believe what they want. I care in the sense that I want them to believe the truth and I want to present the truth to them. But it, it, I'm, that's not my ultimate concern. My concern is when Christianity becomes infected with a symptom of ideological blindness that is, was caused by the disease of relativism. That's what we have to be on the lookout for. And we've got to get it out of Christianity. We've got to get this out of Christianity. But Christianity, I will argue, Christianity has become a super spreader of misinformation of conspiracy theories, and of bad ways of thinking because Christians no longer care about facts. And the only facts that they will accept are the facts that they agree with. I've always said conspiratorial thinking is so maddening because you can't, it's it's hard to rescue people from it. Once they get in it, there's no way to get out of it because here's, here's the way it works. First, here's the conspiracy, whatever the conspiracy is, right? Here's the conspiracy. They become convinced that the conspiracy is real, right? So you come to them and go, man, you've got some conspiratorial thinking here. Here are some facts that counter that. Doesn't matter. The facts then, the facts you present will be viewed as being a part of the conspiracy, right? You say COVID. They say, this is not real about COVID. This is not real about COVID. This is exaggerated. They'll, They'll give you all of these reasons. They'll throw out some kind of, you know, supposed information that, there's no way to document the facts. There's no way to, to, to look at it. You come to them and go, here's this fact and this fact and this fact and this fact. And they're like, well, yeah, they're all basically, they're all part of the conspiracy. So then guess what? They believe the conspiracy. They only believe the facts that support conspiracy. Any facts presented that contradict the conspiracy are part of the conspiracy. Guess what? There's no way to save that person. There's no way to help that person. There's, there's no point. There's no point in even arguing with the person. There's no po- point in even engaging the person. The person has literally become a slave. And then they go around con- spreading that information. And I'm telling you, let me make it very clear. To Christians, when you spread false information, when you spread misinformation, when you do not spread the facts and you out there lying, you're doing the work of Satan. He is the father of lies. You are you are a you are you are spreading deception where the church is supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to be speaking the truth. But once people get into conspiratorial thinking, it's almost impossible to pull them out. Because no you can't you think the way to to, to solve the problem is just give them facts, but the facts no longer matter. Why? Because of relativism. 
which leads to ideological blindness, which makes them vulnerable to conspiratorial thinking, which makes it impossible for you to then to try to re- to rescue them. And it's frightening how this works. It's frightening. You talk to a person that you think is reasonable, you think is rational, but it doesn't matter. Your facts are no longer matter. You can work in the medical world. For, I have filled out, I don't know how many death certificates. I can take all of my medical experience of 22 years working in the medical world and nobody cares. They don't care. They don't care. It, it's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. Uh, the, the, my, my daughter yesterday uh, for her job, she had to uh, do a, a CPR uh, certification course again. Um, it's a yearly thing. And uh, the person who was teaching the CPR has, has 32 years of an ICU nurse. I mean, she's got 32 years of medical experience, 32 years. And she was, she was you know, talking about, you know, doing CPR and all the precautions they're going to have to take for COVID to do the, 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 the CPR course. And there was a, a, a younger girl who, who works in daycare, works in daycare, right? Never worked in the medical world, doesn't have a medical degree, never worked in a hospital. She's, she's, she's a daycare worker, right? She, she takes care of babies, right? Okay, not saying it's, I'm not saying it's not an important job, but in other words, she doesn't have any medical credentials, qualifications at all. So the, uh, the nurse was talking about COVID, uh, you know, uh, social distancing, wearing a mask, et cetera. And then here's this young girl who starts arguing with this ICU nurse who's been a nurse for like 32 years, some crazy number of years, telling her mask don't work. That's all stupid. That's all a lie. That's all a conspiracy. And the nurse is like, what are you talking? Where, where did you go to medical school? Where, where, where? But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The nurse is an idiot and a person who works in daycare. She knows all the facts. You know how she knows all the facts? She saw a YouTube video. Da, 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 da. That's all it takes. She saw something on social media. She saw a post. She doesn't know firsthand information versus secondhand information. She didn't verify sources. She didn't check anything. She didn't double check anything. But there she was spouting out her her propaganda because she wasn't willing to listen to any facts. That's how it works. That's where our society has gone. Now, again, I understand why. I understand why. Why it's in society. Here's what happened. Society was sitting there and someone came and, and they injected them with relativism. And once you inject them with relativism, then they become vulnerable to all kinds of wacky ways of thinking. I understand how it happened in society, but the church should have been the ones going, no, 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 no. We believe in absolute truth. We believe in truth. We believe in facts. We believe in evidence. We believe in research. We believe in not spreading lies. We believe in not spreading false information. Because God hates lying lips. God hates deception. God tells us to stop lying. Put away lying. Speak the truth with every man. In love, we are to speak truth. That's what we are called to do. So you think Christians would have been somehow protected from this. But no, 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 no. It came, we, we got, because guess where Christians do? They leave the church and they go into society. And next thing you know, they were being injected with relativistic thinking, which led to ideological blindness, which made them not only vulnerable to conspiratorial thinking, they become super spreaders of it. Christianity has become the problem. That is my concern. All right, now, I laid, I hope I laid a pretty good uh, framework right there. I try to offer the best analysis I can. I know some of that is very repetitive because I've stated it a million times and I feel like I've been stating this for 20 years, but we've got to scream this louder and louder. We've got to understand what has happened. We've got to look at what has happened. We've got to understand how we got where we are. So I'm glad this news uh, source is asking, how, why is 2020 the perfect storm? I think I just gave you the reason. Now we're going to go to the news report and we're going to see what they have to say and see if they, if they offer a very good reason. Here we go. So I'm scrolling through some of these accounts on Twitter and I can see there's a post here saying the deep state has infiltrated everywhere. This will backfire on the deep state. Another, you are witnessing firsthand and in real time the single largest takedown of entrenched absolute corruption in the history of mankind. And if I just keep scrolling, there's another one here. Here's a picture of Donald Trump with Jesus standing behind him with his hand on his shoulder. 
And if I keep going down, I, I can see another post saying censorship will continue to increase between now and November. How will you know outcome of presidential election between real Donald Trump and Joey bribes Biden? The media will lie while censoring truth. But where did this all start? On the 28th of October 2017, a message signed with a single letter Q was posted on the anonymous online messaging board 4chan. More posts then began to appear. They were cryptic, contained slogans and pro-Trump themes. These known simply as Q drops or breadcrumbs. And it really started as a narrative that there was a individual who called themselves Q and claimed that they had access to top secret information within the US government. Part of that top secret information included this narrative that there was a left-wing deep state intertwined with people who were running child sex trafficking rings and that essentially were trying to destroy America. Yes, people believed that Q was a government insider committed to exposing the hidden truth revealing to them. And that Donald Trump was the sort of savior that was going to rescue the country from the machinations of of the deep state. For a couple of years, this conspiracy floated around the internet, shared amongst various small right-wing communities. Then this summer, it exploded and went mainstream. In just three years, it's gone from anonymous posts on fringe message boards to having at least 100,000 followers. The FBI has described it as a potential domestic terror threat, and the President of the United States has refused to discredit it. Well, I don't know much about the movement other than I understand they like me very much, uh, which I appreciate. But I don't know much about the movement. Uh, I have heard that it is gaining in popularity. How has an absurd conspiracy theory taken hold of people's minds, destroyed families and begun to spread around the world? Now, please note, the one thing they're not going to mention is how has it infiltrated the church? It may have destroyed families. It may have taken over people's minds. What I'm worried about is how did it ever end up inside the church? How do you have actual pastors who will try to connect Q drops to biblical prophecy from the pulpit? How do you have pastors who are well-known Bible teachers who are known for great expositional preaching standing behind the pulpit saying certain things in regards to COVID that come straight from QAnon? How does that happen? How? How does that happen? Because Christians should be like, no, 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 no. Okay, that's the claim. Research, 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 research. I need facts. I need facts. I need facts. I'm going to be skeptical until I have facts. And if I don't have facts, I'm not going to state it, especially not from behind a pulpit. Not from behind a pulpit. Not even in front of a microphone. Christians should not be, especially not on social media, because we want the world to know. You know who you can trust to tell the truth? Christians. You know who you can trust to have their facts straight? Christians. But I've said it before and I say it again. I don't trust a thing that comes out of Christianity. I don't, I, I, every time, in fact, here in in a little bit, I'm getting ready to go home, get some lunch. And when I drive, I'm going to be tempted to turn on American Family Radio. And when I turn on American Family Radio, I'm going to hear conspiratorial thinking, whacked out of their minds, political hijacked garbage. I'm going to hear misinformation, absolute lies. I have a better chance of hearing truth by turning on NPR and and which people will say have a strong liberal bias. But I still feel like I'll get something far more factual because I don't know how many times Christian radio has said things and then you go research it and like, that's just an absolute lie. It's an absolute hoax. And then you tell other Christians that's a hoax and they'll be like, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Yeah, because you, you can't you can't see facts because of your ideological blindness. And why do you have ideological blindness? Because you were injected with relativism, which is leading to your conspiratorial thinking. You've got a disease and you need a cure. And the cure is truth. So I, I, I'm, 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 I'm glad that they're trying to figure out how it spread. How did this happen? But, but remember, for us, we, how did it get into the church? That is where our concern is. Is but let's see how it got it. Let's see what their answer is. Let's see because I did. I did, I'm going to be interested to see what the news media. What did? How did they? How did it spread? 
I, I want to know if they have any real answers to how it spread. Because I'm telling you, if, unless they go to relativism and the spread of relativism and how that laid the, the philosophical foundation for conspiratorial thinking and ideological blindness, unless they go to relativism, I don't think they're going to get to the heart of the matter. But let's see where they go. Welcome to the Sky News Daily Podcast with me, Noel Phillips. Thanks for joining us as we examine the story beyond the headline on today's episode. 50% of Trump supporters believed in QAnon and specifically about the belief that Democrats are involved with these child sex trafficking rings. We look at the spread of QAnon during lockdown. Jeffrey Epstein was not working alone. The psychology of conspiracy theories. We're not more convincing than a satisfying story about pedophiles and the day of reckoning. Well, geez, maybe we need to revisit the story we're telling. And how the current climate is fueling a new theory. We're all told we carry this dreaded boogeyman virus, so we have to wear masks. It's a tool. It's hard to get your head around. If you haven't heard of QAnon before, then you might think what you just listened to was a bit of a joke. And if you've heard of it, then you, like me, are probably trying to come to terms with how fast it's growing. Polls suggest that half of Trump supporters believe that top Democrats are involved in a sex trafficking ring. An avowed QAnon supporter looks likely to win election to Congress next week. The movement is spreading around the world. And the president has refused to distance himself from it. This is Joseph Peer. He's a professor of psychiatry at the University of California in Los Angeles. Human trafficking is not a conspiracy theory. Human trafficking is not a conspiracy theory. It's increasingly clear that some of the core QAnon beliefs, although it's a relatively new phenomenon, at least in the sense that they call themselves QAnon, these are actually really recycled, long-standing conspiracy theories that go back many years, if not centuries or more. One of the most sort of popular conspiracy theories has to do with this idea of the Illuminati, a secret group of very powerful people who are controlling world affairs. And so the idea of the deep state, and particularly the expansion beyond the U.S., really overlaps with that long-standing belief. Oh, I remember. <laughs> I remember uh, back in the day, okay? I don't know how many years ago it was, but when I did the News and Focus program, I don't know how many times I'd get emails from Christians, the Illuminati, the Illuminati, the Illuminati. Remember the whole Beyonce thing? She's the Illuminati. She's a part of the Illuminati. And all these Christians running around, the Illuminati, the Illuminati, the Illuminati. But guess what? They quickly drop that and I'll move on to other things. The deep state, whatever. It, it's just what, what, what drives me crazy about the conspiratorial thinking people is they will hold to a conspiracy. And then they'd either A, they just drop the conspiracy and move on to the next conspiracy. Or when their one conspiracy is disproven, they don't care. They just move on. They never repent. They never apologize. And, 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 and again, I'm speaking of Christians who are out there spreading the nonsense. When they'll just move on to the next one. They never catch on. That you're buying into this, that, that literally your conspiratorial thinking is absolutely at odds with Christianity. And then they always try to say, well, you know, the Bible speaks of Satan and he's conspiring. We're talking of theory. Like, like if you want to argue that Satan is out there conspiring, quote me a scripture and I'll say amen. If you're going to try to then jump from that to some wild conspiracy theory where you have no actual facts and you're, and you're misrepresenting information and you're misleading people, that's not Christianity. You're doing the very work of Satan. That's the problem. So I, I just, yeah, these are old conspiracies that are recycled because the conspiracy thinking never stops. They just move on and move on and move on. You saw this with Alex Jones. If you ever listen to Alex Jones, he'll throw out some wild claim, right? Not so. And then either it never, there's no proof that ever comes forward or it's absolutely disproven that, he's a, that he was wrong. He doesn't come back and apologize. 
No, he doesn't come back and say I was wrong. Now they're a bit there. Now with the Sandy Hook thing, he's definitely come back and tried to back that down way, way back because he's being sued by everyone, right? He's being sued and all of the attempts to try to stop the lawsuit, he, he keeps losing those court battles. Yeah, now he's changing his tune. Yeah, because your your whole operation is about to be sued into oblivion because you are out there lying about a mass shooting. And I don't know how many Christians would send me videos saying, Sandy Hook, it's lies. It's, uh, 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 you know, uh, crisis actors and all the other things. And then I would say, what are you talking about? Guess where they, all those Christians, they didn't come back and apologize. No, they just moved on to the next conspiracy theory. They probably went from Sandy Hook to now they're on QAnon. And it's just like, how can Christians do this? Again, I've explained my reasoning, but we'll go through. So so they're arguing these are old conspiracies just kind of recycled and repackaged. I, I got no problem with that. Some of the more outlandish aspects of QAnon include beliefs that these deep state people are harvesting adrenochrome from children and ingesting it as a sort of fountain of youth potion, which that really is sort of stretching belief, but that actually mirrors some of the conspiracy theories from a century ago that were published in the protocols of the elders of Zion and put forward the myth of the Jewish blood libel, where there was claimed that Jews were basically killing, sacrificing, and eating children. And so actually many of these themes are really recycled old, long-standing conspiracy themes. We obviously know the authorities are concerned about this movement. Uh, I think they're currently being monitored across social media. But there is one thing I'm wondering if you can try and answer for me. Uh, Q, who supposedly shares secret information about the fight by a cryptic online post. Is that an actual person? Do we know of that? And, you know, somebody pretending to be somebody else? There's been, I think, reasonable evidence that Q may in fact be multiple people, not a single individual really as a way to make money, people who are making sizable sums from selling QAnon paraphernalia, but also as a way to steer political narratives. So I think that's essentially support the campaign of President Trump. And in fact, just just I think this week, a new poll, I think by Yahoo, showed that 50% of Trump supporters believed in QAnon and specifically about the belief that Democrats are involved with these child sex trafficking rings. And would you say these are young people or older people? I mean, I'm just trying to build a picture of the sort of person who might be part of this movement. Sure. So the, the short answer is we don't really know. There is some evidence that there are quite a few older people involved, perhaps older people who during the pandemic have found themselves online a lot more than they had previously those people tend to share so-called fake news more often on the internet than younger people. But of course, that's a generalization, and, and there's certainly many young people are too. I think if there's one discriminating factor, it's that QAnon really does exist as primarily an online movement. So when we talk about who is a QAnon believer, it's really somebody who spends quite a bit of time online, and particularly in some of these what what I keep calling backroom niches. And that's where we tend to see a lot of these conspiracy theories, you know, being discussed in the shadows. But I'm just wondering if you can now talk me through the process in, and I'm just going to break it down, just so for people who perhaps have never heard of this, we're going to make this really simple. How do you go from reading a Facebook post to then believing that former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton is a paedophile? Right. It's a great question. There is some evidence that one of the sort of pathways to these kinds of belief really has to do with the way the internet algorithms are built. And so the internet does seem to sometimes steer us into some of those dark areas because the videos or or the things that we click on do tend to be linked to one another. For example, we've learned this in the anti-vaccine movement, that there's a lot of interconnection between, let's say, anti-vaccine conspiracy theories and just general wellness sites. So if you're on Facebook looking at wellness and how to stay healthy, you're more likely to be fed videos about anti-vaxxers. And so the same thing seems to be happening with QAnon, that sometimes the internet leads us in those directions. Save our children! Save our children! Save our children! 
Now, he didn't really answer the question. His argument is is basically the way you get from reading it on Facebook to believing it is basically a, a result of exposure. If you're exposed to it, I no, that's not getting to the underlying issue. How I can be exposed. I listen. I listen to Alex Jones all the time. All right. My wife absolutely hates it because when I go to bed, I have to listen to something. If I don't listen to something, my brain is always moving at three million miles per second. You usually hear that when, when I try to talk because I'm 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 speaking, but my mind is like three days ahead of me. It's already somewhere else thinking about my mind is just always going, 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 going. And I'm always thinking about everything, thinking, 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 thinking. So when I go to when I try to go to sleep and I lay down, I can't even explain to you. It's like the volume in my brain goes from zero to a billion decibels. It's just so loud with so many thoughts about this and this. And, and, and I start thinking about every book I've ever read, every news article I've ever heard, every sermon I've ever heard, every college lecture I ever said, it, every paper. I mean, just every thought just. So what I have to do is I have to listen to one thing so that my mind will focus on the one thing that I'm listening to, which will allow my mind. Then the volume goes down because it's focused on one thing, and then I can usually try to go to sleep. So I choose all kinds of things to listen to, sermons, uh, you know, very traditional conservative Christian radio, uh, BBN, Fundamental Broadcasting Network, uh, Redeemer Broadcasting. I used to listen to family radio until they've changed so much. I'm not a, a big fan of their overnight music anymore, but you get the idea. Very conservative hymns, lectures, sermons, news. It's just got to be something. And one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll usually start the night out with will be Alex Jones. And people are like, well, why will you listen to Alex Jones? Because look, I'm not, I, I don't care the perspective. I don't care the perspective. I, will, I listen to Rush Limbaugh. I listen to Sean Hannity. I listen to Glenn Beck. I, I'll watch Rachel Maddow. I'll watch The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. I don't care what the perspective. I watch the BBC, Al Jazeera, uh, Russia Today. I don't care what it is. I listen to it. Why? Because to me, it's just perspectives and information. And I try to, and I throw out the, the perspective, the opinion. I try to get down to the fact. They state a fact. I go research said fact. And then I try to form an opinion based off all the facts that I can come up with. So I'm, I'm not afraid of information. I don't want anyone censored. I want everyone's information available. I don't want anything blocked. I don't want anything censored. I want freedom. I love freedom. But here's the thing. Just because I'm exposed to wackiness doesn't mean I embrace wackiness. I, I don't get that. I don't understand how people... I, I, I think that's a cop out. Well, you know, you know how anti-vaccine works. You know, you're looking up health. Next thing you know, you get an anti-vaccine video. And the next thing you know, you believe it. Why? <laughs> if I see an anti-vaccine thing, I'm going to go, well, let me do some study here. Let me do some research here. Where did they get this? Oh, they're quoting a medical journal where the person who wrote said medical journal renounced what he said and it's proved to be false. And I've seen a lot of anti-vaccine uh, people do that. Um, and when I pointed that out, anti-vaccine people get mad at me. But it's like if you've got fraudulent information, then your view is fraudulent, at least on the surface, until you ha bring me facts that are actual verifiable, can be looked up and researched. I don't I don't look. The reason exposure leads to belief is because people have bought into the idea that uh, they that they don't understand the concept of absolute truth, and that when you hear something, you have to be able to distinguish between opinion and claim versus fact. Like anyone can make an opinion, anyone can make a claim. You can make a claim that that uh, aliens from outer space. Uh, or are responsible for 9-11 and the terrorist attacks in America. It wasn't actual human beings. It was uh, aliens. I can make that claim, right? Make, maybe great for a great radio show, right? But guess what? I, now I can distinguish between a claim and an opinion, and then I have to look at facts. What are verifiable? From what source are the facts coming from? How many uh, other sources will verify this? But if you begin to deny absolute truth, then it becomes this, if you believe it, it's true. If you hear it, it's true. If you agree with it, it's true. So that, like, uh, he, he still, I mean, exposure cannot be the problem. Hey, you get exposed to this stuff, that's how you believe it. There's got to be some underlying thinking. There's some something going on in the thinking that allows you to become vulnerable to it. I mean, I can be exposed to any idea. It doesn't make me, make, mean I'm going to believe it in any way, shape, or form. 
One of QAnon's most public and persistent campaigns is their affiliation with Save the Children. In July this year, the group hijacked an anti-trafficking charity and used it to spread false claims that celebrities and top Democrats are running a child trafficking ring. Just before the charity was hijacked, many social media sites began removing QAnon accounts. Save the Children linked profiles provided the conspiracy theorists with a platform that was much harder to police. But Save the Children is also... A great example of what I call a, a kind of hook. There's a number of different sort of tentacles of QAnon that can reach out and, and grab people. So there have been organized or rallies or marches around Save Our Children, Save the Children, the idea that we need to fight sex trafficking or, or fight child abuse, which of course are themes that hopefully all of us can can support. Sometimes people have gone to those rallies or meetings or gone to those online spaces not knowing that there's actually a deeper connection to the QAnon movement. The hook worked. There were marches over here in the UK too. One organised by Freedom of the Children UK, with over 100 people walking to Buckingham Palace with signs saying things like paedophiles will bring down the royal family and save our children, jail the Clintons. So QAnon have been using social media to draw in children's charity supporters to campaigning against figures they believe are paedophiles in positions of power. Dr. Ashley Frawley is a senior lecturer in social policy at Swansea University. Ashley, listen, like you and everyone else who might be listening to this podcast right now, we all have bad days and bad things happen to us. For example, you're running for that train, you're, you miss it by literally two to three seconds, you see the door shut. I mean, I, I don't then believe that the reason I missed that train is because a famous politician is a paedophile and, and I'm going to blame them. Or, <laughs> or for example, there's the, the, the train driver is evil. No, no, of course not. But you might say later on, let's say you missed that train and then you met the girl of your dreams and you got married. <laughs> and you would say, it's fate. It was God's will. The stars <laughs> aligned. <laughs> so although it's mad, it is an expression of something familiar to all of us. Obviously, you know, looking into this issue, it's so fascinating. And I remember in the aftermath of the 9-11 attack, there were so many conspiracy theories of people building their own alternative, you know, as to what happened that day. From your perspective, you know, how do people sort of come to the conclusion that they may take one big impactful event that happens and then add their own spin to it? Well, I think as human beings, that's kind of what we do. We, we tell stories about our existence. We join together the dots and we make them meaningful. We really wouldn't be able to maintain our sanity without doing that. And I think kind of ironically, <laughs> um, it can also seem to drive us insane if we go too far into what is a very kind of simplistic narrative that often emerges after these kinds of events where we convince ourselves that there is a plot to hurt victims who are wholly innocent and villains who are wholly evil. That kind of narrative, obviously, historically, is as old as human society, and it's probably the more simplistic narrative. And what it basically says is that there are people in the world who really know how all this stuff works. They know how society works. They know exactly what they're doing. And they are able to consciously direct things to their own, ultimately, nefarious ends. There is a tendency still, even now, to believe that those in power know really what's going on here. And they know exactly how to fix things, but they don't. They don't because they don't want to, because they're in power, because they're evil. And that's actually something that's really, really common I think it becomes more common as other ways of thinking about social problems and social issues, which are much more complex, have kind of faded into the background. And our, our kind of political movements that used to represent much more complex narratives of history and, and society and social problems have kind of diminished. And so what you get is this need to capture people's attention about a wide variety of issues through this melodramatic narrative of evil villains and horribly suffering victims. Yeah. It's our enemies aren't people who are wrong 
or who have different interests to us, they're evil. The victims, they're not fully like developed kind of human beings. They're like, it's like this angelic kind of with like QAnon, it's children who are, you know, being sexually abused. And it's like the innocence of children in our culture tends to be held up as the highest sort of thing. Children have a duty to be happy. They're asexual. They're wholly innocent. And so when you take children, that is like the symbol of all that is good. A question that I think it's really important for me to ask is, why do seemingly sane people believe conspiracy theories? Well, I mean, we all believe stories. We all tell stories about the world that wrap it up in a neat little bow. I mean, have you ever said everything happens for a reason? I mean, I tend to say that quite a lot, actually. But <laughs> we, well, there's always a threshold. There's always a line as to how far you actually go. And, because... Well, is there? I mean, religions, if you really think about world religions, they can get a bit crazy. That's the human propensity to storytell. Right? We join together the dots and we give the dots meaning. Within a particular culture, you're much more likely to emphasize particular aspects of the world than others. Yeah. And I think in our culture, all of these older kind of shared meaning systems like tradition are starting to wane and religion are starting to wane, at least in terms of giving large groups of people a shared sense of meaning. And but so surely... things kind of come up. Yeah. Um, and I think people who are already on the fringes of society just any uh, just the one word that nobody will speak on this podcast about the reason people are buying into to conspiracy theories they won't use the word truth the culture has abandoned the concept of truth and when you abandon the concept of truth then deception grows into a massive forest okay and then nobody can find their way out nobody can find it grows into a a a, a, a rainforest into a jungle it, it grows into a giant cave in which you can never find your way back out of you cannot abandon truth and then go i don't know why conspiracy well i think the way con- conspiracy theories are spreading cuz we, we people like like, uh, they like to create a narrative and they like to, they're like, we, we tell stories and, and look at religions. Well, religions are based off a belief that what we believe is true and that we argue for certain arguments to try to prove what we believe, either manuscript evidence or, or historical evidence or archaeological evidence. We try to hold to it and say, here's what we have. Now, we do, I, we have to accept that as religious people, as Christians, that there is an element of faith. We believe facts can only get us so far and then we take it by faith. So we, I will agree that there is an element that maybe religion makes people vulnerable to conspiratorial thinking because so many Christians seem vulnerable to it. I will accept that. But I'm telling you, if, if you throw out religion and God, then where, where, where does truth come from? Is there anything called absolute truth? Is there anything called absolute morality? We, we can get to a whole discussion about that. But but I just find it interesting that here we're, there's only about 15 minutes left in this program and no one has mentioned the word truth. Truth. Now, maybe, maybe the word has been used and I missed it, but I haven't heard it anyway. We, we've got to get back to there is a thing called absolute truth. And if things do not correspond to reality and facts, it must be rejected. End of story. But, uh, yeah, they're trying to come up with all these, you know, it's it's exposure. It's it's you just like to create a narrative that that puts a nice bow on and we tell stories. It's like, well, can you anyone explain what's going on? Look, if this is the best we can come up with to explain conspiratorial thinking, we're doomed. Society feel that they are are pushed out of society. Why would you have a threshold for polite society and beliefs that seem right in polite society when polite society has kicked you out? But surely believing one conspiracy theory as true makes it much easier to believe in all other theories. Yeah, definitely. And to and to connect them all together as well. Once you fall down the rabbit hole of reading about one conspiracy theory, it's easy to start thinking everything is connected. <laughs> There's also this belief as well that JFK Jr. faked his death in 1999 in a plane crash to escape the deep state plotters. That's right. And, you know, these are examples of some of the more outlandish theories because it's not only that JFK Jr. faked his death, but also some beliefs that he's now in some way taken the form of someone else with a different appearance. There's also talk about how he's going to, I think actually this week or next week, going to kind of come out and reveal himself uh, having been hidden these several years 
and the narrative about why he would be in cahoots with Donald Trump, uh, you know, I have yet to understand. I think this is a good time to bring in Kate. As you will hear, she has pretty strong views on a lot of things, but she's an interesting person to talk to in light of what Ashley and Joseph have just told us. I have seen that QAnon have discussed that he is indeed alive and and due to come back where is he if he's alive where where is he (laughs) well maybe he's hiding with the queen because i've not seen much of her lately either but she was out last week doing an engagement weren't she with her grandson Uh, 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 reported in the press but as i've seen lots of lies and misinformation in the press i don't ever believe what i read in the press anymore Oh, there, there. <laughs> see, he's talking to a woman. That's a classic conspiracy theorist. That, that's someone whose classic thinking is so. Look, you, 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 you. They say something. You offer a counter perspective. They just they counter your perspective. You say, "Well, it was in the news." Don't believe the news. And here's the thing: guess what they believe? They only believe what agrees with the conspiracy. That that, that, that it's maddening. I like I have a heart. I don't even know if I'll be able to finish listening to this because I, 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 I just start. Oh, I just start losing it. it because you can't reason with these people. Like, well, here's some information. I don't believe that information. So what, where did you get your information? Well, I got this YouTube video. And you're like, or, or you're like I got this article. And you go look at the article. Like, that was a blog written by someone like what? what? There's no actual information. Usually the information they send you to is information that has there's no documentation. It's not verifiable or the people were claiming that they're, they're, they're referencing a document and then you go look up the document and then they're not even referencing or, re- or representing the document correctly. Like if I see another person uh, speak about COVID numbers and don't understand how comorbidity works, I'm like, and then when you point that out, it doesn't matter. They still believe that they still believe their conspiracy theory. You can't, you can't fix this. It's a disease. It needs chemotherapy to get out of the body. It's sad. It's so sad to hear these people who go this. And like he's sitting there presenting counterfacts. It doesn't matter. He's asking questions that clearly, clearly demonstrates that, hey, you're out of your mind. And the person doesn't even get it. They just keep going. Like you don't even realize people are laughing at you. You sound insane. I don't, I don't care if I sound insane. You should care because maybe if everyone thinks you sound insane, it's because you are. You should care. You should seek help. Okay? It's, oh, I don't know how much I'm going to listen to this. We're, we're going to see where this goes. Here we go. Now, just to give you a bit of background, Kate Shimirani is the face of the anti-vaccine movement in the UK. In August, you could see her in Trafalgar Square with her megaphone, rallying a crowd of anti-vaxxers. She previously worked as a nurse, but was suspended in July and still refers to herself as a healthcare practitioner. Talk to me about the current climate. What are your beliefs? Well, I'm very evidence-based. I'm uh, science-led. So... And they're not really beliefs. I wouldn't say they're beliefs. I'd, uh, based on reading a lot of literature, scientific evidence-based peer-reviewed studies and books, then my opinion is based on that. So I wouldn't actually say it's beliefs. I would say it's more evidence-based. I knew she was anti-vaccine. She's been very vocal about that. But like Ashley said earlier, it's very easy to start finding connections and going down the rabbit hole. During our conversation, it became clear that Kate has other theories. Would you say you're a COVID denier? I, I would say that I am evidence-based. But, but, so I don't, but, deny, I don't deny SARS-CoV-2. I don't deny that people are dying. I don't deny that people are having tests done with, the SARS, with this uh, PCR test. What I'm telling you is the science and the evidence behind it. So I, I don't deny anything. We all have coronaviruses. We know that. Dogs have coronaviruses. So we all have coronavirus. Are we talking about SARS-CoV-2? Are we talking about COVID-19? It's never been visualized and isolated in purified virus. So it's now a rumor. And we're now using a test, which in, in effect is faulty, should never be a diagnostic. We now have a scenario where... You are testing healthy, asymptomatic persons 
with a test that isn't a diagnostic tool. And based on that, you're isolating them and closing down entire areas. Yes. I mean, there'll be a lot of people listening who will just say, you know, those beliefs are completely baseless but another thing that well, I well, excuse to... me may I answer that to those who are mm-hmm. listening and say those beliefs are baseless again I would say to you okay then go and research as I have come back and we'll have a debate and one of the things that I've said which people have um, been very concerned about is when I've said no vaccine has ever been proven safe No vaccine has ever been proven effective and no two vaccines have ever been tested together for their efficacy. And what that means for the lay person is when you have a drug, it will have an effect on the human body. When you have another drug, it will have an effect on the human body. When you put those two together, they can have a completely different effect. And to challenge it, then it would bring in the freedom of information and everything would be out on the table. And people might then be very, very concerned that they have had vaccines or will be pro-vaccination without actually knowing the facts. One of the things I want to question you about is Donald Trump's COVID-19 diagnosis. Was that made up or do you believe that is an actual real life event? He came out to the public and he, his doctor confirmed that he did contract COVID-19? Well, his doctors confirmed it. Again, everyone must take that on face value. For me, as an evidence-based health practitioner, you know, I would say I'd like to see his blood results. I'd like to see his x-rays. I'd like to see his scans. It's a miraculous recovery. If he did indeed have COVID-19, then let's take this on face value. Excellent. He made a miraculous recovery, which proves what? that this does not indeed kill. And even if one looks at the statistics, which have already been put out there, it has a a death rate of under 1%, which means we are destroying the economy and closing the entire country down, destroying people's lives. Suicides are up, stopping cancer treatments for something that is not deadly, which is ridiculous. A lot of QAnon followers believed that it was a fake and Donald Trump was using it as a cover to arrest and try and get Hillary Clinton into prison? Well, Hillary Clinton, uh, I have my opinions on that. I was very, um, I, for the last nine... So, no, no, so, so Kate, do you believe it was a cover? Do you, so you don't believe well, that Well, I haven't president... seen evidence of that. Hillary Clinton still seems to be at large. Based on everything that I've followed from Hillary Clinton over the last nine years, I personally cannot understand why that woman is not behind bars for for, uh, being implicated in murder. Just to set the record straight, Hillary Clinton has not been implicated in murder. But that idea that the Clintons secretly murdered their political opponents is another conspiracy theory that has been doing the rounds for nearly 30 years. I asked Ashley how people can actually walk around with the belief system in their head when all evidence tells us something different. Those ideas that get passed around and repeated in the all those claims that that woman made regards to to COVID, everything, those are all straight out of QAnon conspiracy theory, all of it. And you could sit here and we could try to go from each, all the, all the claims, all the claims. But just please note, she kept saying, I'm evidence-based. I'm evidence-based. I'm science. I'm evidence-based. Yeah, evidence-based on the evidence that you accept and any evidence that contradicts what you say, it's, it's, it's not. In fact, while while this was while this was happening, while this was on the air, I just got this notification. While while where we're listening to this, this literally just happened. Just just shows you how crazy this has gotten. Let me see if I can find the um, notification. Give me one second. Yes, this just popped up on my uh, news notification. Donald Trump Jr. says recent COVID nineteen deaths are almost nothing. More than twenty thousand people died this month. So you got Donald Trump Jr. saying, hey, COVID deaths, they're almost nothing. They're almost nothing. And then then the the report says 20,000 people died this month. 20,000 people died this month alone. But guess what? If I present those numbers to someone, they'll be like, no, 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 no. You can't trust those numbers. Those numbers are not telling the truth. Those numbers are lies. Those numbers are misinformation. And then they'll try to argue. And then when they start trying to argue, they'll, they'll, they'll clearly demonstrate that I don't even understand how to read statistics that don't understand that. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just, you just one claim after another claim 
Everyone claims that they have the facts, but we've lost the ability to even figure out what the facts are because we've lost the idea of truth. All right. And so she just makes all of these claims. Now, listen, let me make it very, very clear. Let me make it very clear. I'm going to get 5,000 emails here. Look, I got no problem asking questions. I got no problem being skeptical. My, my philosophy in life is question everything, right? You tell me something about COVID, I'm all for it. Let's, that's a great theory. That's a great uh, question. Let's, let's do what we can. But you know what? While I question, while I'm skeptical, while I may doubt, I have to go to what the facts lead. I have to research and try to get the best firsthand information from the most credible sources I can come up with and go, here's what the facts point to. Now, I may still be skeptical about it. I may still not like it, but I have. But as a Christian, I've got to ensure that I do not spread misinformation, hearsay, rumor, and craziness that cannot be verified. But you can't just say, you're fact-based, and then you're like, here's 20 facts. I don't believe any of those facts because you can't trust it. Okay, well, then guess what? You get to determine what the facts are. You get to determine what the truth is, and then your truth becomes the dominant truth. That's straight out of relativism. The only difference is now relativism, it's your truth and your truth now supersedes everyone else's truth. Where originally relativism was you could have your truth and I could have my truth and we're both true. Now it's no, your truth becomes the dominant truth. All right, let's continue. The culture, or at least within certain subcultures, usually have some features that make them likely to be believed. It speaks to people's existing beliefs about how the world works. So for one portion of society, you might have this sense that, well, society is basically good. Everything would just work fine if it weren't for these really bad people. And what we need to do is we need to root out these bad people. And now that actually has a very old history. And there's a crazy version of that. And there's also a version of that that is actually just like a common sense way of thinking about social problems. So what sociologists call social pathology. It basically says society is healthy. When things go wrong, we can trace the roots to bad people. Bad people are like a cancer on the healthy body. So we will be the cure. So if you belong to a portion of society in which you are already highly patriotic, it may speak to you that this wonderful country and all these good things, you know, they're just beyond our grasp because these bad people are doing a bad thing. But there's another version of that which flips it around, which is the pathological civilization or or the sick society. And the kind of leftist conspiracies can come out of that as well, where it's still individuals that are ultimately to blame for everything, but it's a society itself that's sick. And it infects individuals and it makes individuals selfish. Well, these are both the same kind of idea. Ultimately, individuals are to blame for everything. And it really speaks to more generally a kind of individualized understanding of social problems within our culture. The problem is looking at the thriving community of QAnon supporters, the spread of COVID deniers and the 5G haters. We are in the perfect environment for conspiracy theories to gain followers and the election is only just days away. There is another interesting theory, isn't there, that the storm, it's an event which QAnon supporters believe will see Donald Trump rid Washington of the deep state. Do you believe we're in that moment now? Is that storm that we're seeing sort of bubbling over our heads? I see that looking at the financial markets, I look at China, uh, I look at the Silk Road that opened a couple of years ago, I look at what's happening with the election, I look at what's happening in my own country. I think, again, that would take me back to it is human nature when control is taken away from you, and that is what's happened. Disability, we're all told we carry this dreaded boogeyman virus, so we have to wear masks. It's a tool. It's a tool of compliance. And it's also causing a lot of violence, a lot of verbal aggression. Because the population is now, we're dreading, uh, many people are dreading, is this lockdown coming? Am I going to be able to manage? And so there is this this hysteria, uh, this anxiety. So they feel very out of control. And it is human nature that when you are out of control, you will look to something to be the rescuer. Finally, as we've seen, conspiracy theories can be dangerous 
and Joseph is concerned about the effect that QAnon can have over people. By the sounds of it, it sounds quite addictive. And once you're there, it's impossible to get out. Well, it's certainly very difficult to get out. And this is an area where some people have compared QAnon to a cult. I'm not convinced that, that that's the best way to characterize it, but there are some clear parallels. And this aspect of falling down the rabbit hole and suddenly stumbling upon this new world and new revelations and also finding yourself within a sort of new social network is one of the things that makes it very hard for people to climb out. And they're let's call it real lives, are really suffering. We have to understand what it would sort of cost the individual if they were to come out. In other words, what would they be giving up? And what they would be giving up might be a intense sense of meaningfulness and purpose. One of the interesting aspects of QAnon is that people who participate in that movement take an active role in decoding these drops from Q, and so they feel like they're part of the movement and they're really contributing something substantial. So that meaningfulness would have to be relinquished. And so one thing that's very important if we are trying to help our friends or loved ones who are down that rabbit hole is really to try to maintain connections with them and remind them that there is this world, real world out there waiting for them. In some ways, speaking to you for the last 20 minutes or so has felt like we've just plotted an amazing synopsis for a Hollywood blockbuster because this is all so crazy. Where do you see this all ending at some point, if it ever will end, or do you just see this all mutating and growing and just getting out of control? Fortunately or unfortunately, conspiracy theories have been around, some people have argued, since the dawn of civilization. So I certainly don't expect that they will disappear. On the other hand, we know that conspiracy theories tend to flourish at times of crisis. You know, Hopefully, when we get on the backside of the pandemic, hopefully a change of of leadership and more stability, there will sort of be a decreased need to have conspiracy theories. Your point about Hollywood movies is interesting because conspiracy theories have been a theme of Hollywood movies for many, many years, whether you're talking about The Manchurian Candidate or there was actually a movie called Conspiracy Theory with Mel Gibson uh, some years back. So absolutely, that's going to continue to be a theme in, in terms of entertainment and conspiracy theories really aren't going to go away. But hopefully they'll transform and and be a little less widely embraced as they seem to be at the present moment. Also fascinating. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. That's it. Until next time, my thanks to Dr. Ashley Frawley, Professor Joseph Pierre, and Kate Shemirani. Head to Sky News for the latest on the U.S. election. There you have it. Um, they're not going away. Now, the, before it's all, I guess what we can do to summarize this is pretty simple. We just heard a news media organization try to figure out why there's conspiracy theories and why 2020 is the perfect storm for conspiracy theories. And the one thing they never mentioned was truth. The one concept they never mentioned because the society has abandoned the belief in absolute truth. And then they don't know how to deal with a culture that no longer believes in truth or facts and that everyone's truth becomes the truth. Everyone's narrative becomes the narrative. And you can't even bother. They they don't even bother to try to go there because they don't, they don't have the framework in which to deal with it. So that leaves one place, one place to try to stand against it. And that has to be the church of Jesus Christ, which says there is truth and truth is connected to God himself, which is the God of truth. God is the ultimate source of reality. God is the source of truth. He is truth. And the one thing God hates is any time we, especially those who call him, you know, we call him God. We trust in him. We believe in him. His followers, when we're the ones out there spreading wrong information, misinformation, fraudulent information, and and we're misapplying information, and we don't know what we're talking about, and we're hurting people, and we're misleading people, and we're deceiving people. If they, if people cannot trust you, here's the thing. If people cannot trust you, when you talk about mask, covid Anything, if they can't trust you about that and they begin to see you as questionable source of information, then why would they trust you when you talk about heaven, hell, salvation, the Bible, how to interpret the Bible? Why are they going to believe anything about that if they can't trust you on basic information that they can do a Google search and find out that you're, 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 you're wrong? In fact, when it comes to the death rate, and one was talking about the death rate and all of that, 
what, what, what drives me crazy is I don't think the average person even understands that there's many ways. There's a lot of different ways to measure deaths. The most cited numbers that are often released uh, by hospitals are usually the case fatality rates. All right. The case fatality rates. That's the percentage of deaths among confirmed cases. In contrast, you could, so there's case fatality rates. You could do infection fatality rate, which is typically an estimate of deaths as a proportion of all those who believe to be infected, including people who are asymptomatic or who have mild cases and may not have bothered to get tested. So you got two ways of looking at it, right? So when someone starts talking to me, are you talking about a case fatality rate? Or are you talking about the infection fatality rate? Do you know the difference? Do you know how these are computed? Do you even know how this works? Do you even know how it fig- figures this out? Do you even understand? Do you understand that you can have the uh, cause of death and then you can have additional uh, things that, li- that, that contributed to the death? Here's the number one cause of death, but they have comorbidity. These are other things that could have possibly contributed to it. That doesn't mean the initial thing didn't kill them. It means there was other contributing factors. That doesn't mean COVID didn't kill the person. They don't, it's like you, you've got to try to explain this to people. Well, when you're out there giving wrong information about that, then why can you be trusted about spiritual matters? If you cannot be found faithful in, in little matters, then why will you be trusted in larger matters? If you cannot be trusted to get your facts straight, to get your facts right, I don't care if it's vaccines, I don't care if it's COVID, I don't care if it's politics, I don't care if it's Clintons, I don't care what it is. If you become, mm, that person's always throwing out these crazy, I don't, I'm not going to believe anything, then you destroy your credibility to speak about anything. And that's the problem. We ultimately are doing the work of Satan. The church has to be the place. Look, you're, hey, in a world where you cannot find the truth, please come on in here to the church and we're going we're gonna to stand on the foundation of truth because God is the ultimate source of truth. We believe in the Bible, which is the truth. And we are going to find every, that when we speak about things related to the going on in our society, we're going to be careful. We're going to speak truth. Now, now listen, but I will, I will acknowledge this, and this is very important. And this is the, pr- the balance that Christians, we, 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 we struggle with trying to find this balance. While we care about truth, we also understand that the heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, that Satan is alive and well and working. So we will be skeptical and question things. And we should be skeptical and we should question things. Sometimes people believe that my perspective is believe everything. No. That has never been my perspective. I don't believe everything. What I do is, hmm, I need some facts. And I go research and research and research. And guess what? I have to go with where the facts lead me, right? And I've got to go with verifiable, reliable information, multiple sources, firsthand information, verifiable sources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, here's what I hold to now. Now, that doesn't mean I stop questioning. Doesn't mean I stop asking questions. That's one of the reasons I listen to Alex Jones. That's one of the reasons I, I, I would listen to Coast to Coast AM, um, especially back when Art Bell was the host. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I will. Uh, uh, George Nori, I think, is the uh, the, the host now, if I, if I remember his name correctly. I, I will listen to that. And people say, "Well, why will you listen to that crazy stuff?" Because sometimes they raise questions, right? That sometimes conspiracy theorists raise absolutely questions that everyone else should ask. Sometimes they raise great questions. Sometimes I'm like, "Wow, that mm, that's a good question, Alex. That's okay. Thanks, Alex Jones. Let me go. Let me go ver- look into that." Now, sometimes I go look and research and come out and go, "You're out of your mind," but I still think I'm glad that you raised the question. And then sometimes I'm like, "Whoa, okay, maybe something here." So, but again, it's not my exposure that makes me believe it. I, I'm all for raising questions. We should raise questions. There's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with that. But when you're dealing with something, say, a pandemic, then you've got to believe all the medical world is a part of the grand conspiracy, that the whole world is in the conspiracy, and only the the smart people who watch YouTube videos, they've got it all figured out. They know more about medicine than doctors. Um, And then, and listen, by going against, in many cases, medical advice, no, you're putting yourself at risk, you're putting other people at risk. That's not the gamble I'm willing to take. Um, I, I'm willing to question. I'm willing to go, mm, not, not so sure, not so sure. But until I have verifiable facts, I got to go with facts. It's truth. 
It's truth over opinion. It's facts over claims. It's, it's research. It's thinking. And it's, it's making sure that I do not spread lies or false information. This, this is such a big issue for Christianity right now. I cannot spre- express to you how big an issue this is for Christianity. Christians are becoming the source for false information, and that cannot happen. We cannot be that. We've got to be the source of truth, of reason, of logic, of thinking. And, and when I say that, my atheist friends laugh, go, no, Christians are idiots, and y'all never get information right. And I understand why they believe that, but I'm always like, no, look, I'm a Christian, and I try to do everything I can to get facts. And, li- and listen, if I find out that I'm wrong, I'll be the first to say that I'm wrong. Because, I, I, look, it's not about winning. It's not about, it's not about winning. It's a, it's about, it's not about being right. It's about wanting to ensure that truth is spread. Look, this, the COVID situation, all I know is all the numbers are going through the roof. Right now, mortality rates are still good. Right now, I'm not, when I say good, I, I, I actually, I misspoke. They are good in the sense that they're not spiking. They're horrible because 20,000 people died this month. They're horrific. Over a million people have died in less than a year. That's horrific. And Christians should be mortified and hor- horrified at that because those are human beings who are entering into eternity where there's heaven and hell. We should be completely bothered by that because we're supposedly pro-life. We should be bothered by that. So right now, though, the mortality rate seems to be declining because we seem to be getting better at treating it. However, when cases spike like they are, the death rates always creep up. And so now the numbers could go back up to an alarming rate. And when I say, again, I I completely misspoke, not a good, when I say good, I just want to make sure I verify, I, I clarify what I meant. Good in the sense that we, they're going down. They're going down. So when people go into a, when a person goes into a hospital now, they have a very good chance of survival because the medical community has has gotten very good at treating it. Now, again, I don't know why they would want to treat it because they're supposedly a part of a grand conspiracy. So I don't know why they're trying to treat it in a correct way. Why don't they just let them die and then the death numbers will go up and then they can accomplish the conspiracy that supposedly the whole medical world's into because supposedly the medical world is lying about the number of cases. Supposedly the medical world is lying about the number of deaths. Supposedly, the medical world's lying about everything. So if the medical world's lying about everything, I don't know why the medical world just says, well, then we're not going to treat anyone anymore, and then you can all just die, and we don't have to worry about it. But no, I, I, I don't even know why the medical world is even attempting to treat people. Well, I gotta get, they got to cover. they gotta, they got to maintain their cover so that people on YouTube can find out what's really going on. It's just the whole thing's crazy. So, um, yeah, so... That, that's that's the situation, and it's alarming, it's troubling, it's bo- oh, it bothers me so much. It bothers me so much. It does. And again, I, 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 we should ask questions about COVID. We should. I want, I, we should ask questions about its origins. Where did it come from? Did, was it possibly released from a lab? If it was possibly released from a lab in China, then we need to figure that out. People need to be held responsible. Was it some research gone wrong? Well, what research was happening? What precautions can be taken? Was Did it not? We need to know the origins of it. We need to understand how it, we, we should ask these questions. We, sh- we need to understand how it spread. We need to understand how deadly it is or not deadly it is. And the mortality rates change all the time. They're always going to be going up and going to be down. There's lots of factors that contribute to that. Which people are most vulnerable? What are the things that we need to do to stop the spread of it? What, when is it crazy to lock things down and when is it acceptable to lock things down? When should we uh, d- r- decide not to meet uh, in large numbers and when should we meet in large numbers? These are, and, and we can be skeptical and we can ask questions. That is healthy. So some people think that I'm, that anytime anyone asks questions, that I'm against that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm all for questions, but I want what, what you have to be is reasonable that you ask the question and then you set aside your ideology to pursue the facts and then say, here are the best facts we can come up with. And these facts don't necessarily support my ideology, but I'm going to go with the facts. That's all I'm saying. And I'm, I'm going to get 900 emails claiming that I'm saying something different and you're missing the point. And again, I I don't care what's going on in society. Can't come inside the church. All right, I'll stop right there. I'll stop right there. You can email me your thoughts at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. And I guess the takeaway from all of this, the news media, they're definitely not equipped to deal with issues in relation to conspiratorial thinking and truth. 
because they never even mention truth because, well, they live in, we live in a culture that truth no longer exists. And then we're, cons- then we live in a culture where truth no longer exists. And then we're baffled by living in a culture where there's universal deceit. <laughs> well, there can- there's only going to be universal deceit when we say there is no truth. In fact, how can there even be deceit if there's no truth? Because there's no way to say if something is a true or false. Yeah, we, 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 we killed truth and now we're reaping the consequences of it and we don't even realize, hey, we, get, we need to go resuscitate truth. Truth needs a resurrection, all right? But to be fair from a Christian perspective, truth, well, truth did, res- did die, was buried, and then rose the third day and is seated at the right hand of the Father because there is one eternal God and, G- and obviously Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity. This God is the source of truth, all right? Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He is truth. So if we want to talk about truth dying, well, he, he did. He was crucified. He was buried. He did rise again. He did ascend to the right hand of the Father. And that's where we need to look for truth. And Christians must be supporters of the truth, promoters of the truth, defenders of the truth. And we need to put away lying far from us. That is what I'm trying to lay down. That's the principle I'm trying to get across. All right, I'll stop right there. Everyone have a great day. God bless.